Um, we're going to get started. And I thank everyone from the colleges who's, um, who's joined us. And we're on a new topic. We've been doing some of these pan, uh, events with, with just a real general approach. But today we're gathered uh, to talk about the liberal arts. And I think each of you are going to walk through some background about your institutions to keep it grounded in kind of who you are, but then also address just what the liberal arts can mean for our students. So I really appreciate this conversation. It's one we probably should have more often in, uh, in admission with uh, given how important this really is. So let's, we're gonna go alphabetical by institution. That means we're gonna start with Bethany Lutheran and Ben. Thanks Ben for joining us. Thanks for having me, John. Uh, yeah, as John said, my name is Ben from Bethany Lutheran. Uh, I went to Bethany once upon a time and I've been in this role in admissions uh, for four years now. Um, yeah, liberal arts, I, I agree. I echo what, what you were just saying. Uh, something that really defines a big part of who we are as Bethany and a lot of other colleges as well, um, but something we don't always talk about. Um, I think a big part of that is, is just the name liberal arts um, immediately like goes to some kind of political meaning and throws people off and stuff. Bethany is, is extremely conservative and we have a great arts program, but we have many other great things to offer as well. Um, but yeah, to us here at Bethany, liberal arts uh, speaks to our goal, our aim to, to make students and graduates of Bethany uh, very well-rounded. Um, we do that by incorporating things like critical thinking skills, uh, problem-solving skills, leadership into all of our programs and activities across campus. Uh, our, our goal is to, as is any other college, our job is to prepare you for the real world, so to speak, and, and the jobs or careers that come with that in the real world. Uh, that's why students ultimately go to college, right, is to, to get a, a, a job and, and kind of transition into the next part of their life. Um, but in addition to preparing students, graduates, for, for that job, whatever comes next in their, in their 20s, um, we want them to be prepared for and equipped for whatever life throws at them in addition to whatever job they, they uh decide to pursue. Um, and so that's where those critical thinking, leadership, problem solving skills uh, come into play. Um, we, one thing we always say when we uh, are talking to students is, yes, we want to prepare you to be a doctor, a lawyer, a therapist, a businessman, whatever you uh, want to pursue. But at the same time, we want you to be prepared for jobs that maybe don't even exist yet. Um, in a second here, I'm going to share my screen. I've just got a handful of slides with kind of some examples and, and cool stories to tie together with this. Um, so I'll get to that in a second. Um, but, but yeah, that's ultimately what Bethany thinks of when we think of liberal arts is we're giving you a broad, in-depth educational experience that's not just job training, but it's a whole lot more than that to, to prepare you for whatever life uh, career hurdles that you may have to jump over at age 25 or at age 65 or somewhere in between. And um, I think, again, to echo what John said, having this conversation in the state of where we are right now with a pandemic um, and, you know, people being laid off, out of work, working virtually from home, um, a liberal arts education and experiences probably more valuable than maybe it's ever been, um, trying to move forward and still work and learn and grow in this environment that we're in right now. Um, let's see if I can share my screen here and show you a couple things. I'm going to attempt a, a video here at some point at the end too, it's real short. Um, okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen here. Shoot me a message if you can't or if I'm not doing this correctly but um so this first uh slide here let me get into the here we go so this uh first slide is a fun one we like to use in our presentations um it is a theater production that is very unique to Bethany and uh is 
something that we've been doing for a long time, like 20 plus years now. Um, hey ben, um, we, I think we can't quite see your screen. You might want to, if, if it's in a slideshow presentation, there we go. And is this better? It, yeah, that's much better. And I think it would work if you, um, yeah, great. Is that perfect. better? Okay. Yeah, my bad. No, it's all I've good. got two, two screens up and I thought it shared the right one, but maybe it did it. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, uh, this is a picture of kind of a fun one as you can see uh, from uh, something we call feeder physics. It's a theater event that they've had every fall on campus for two plus decades. And uh, I've heard a number of professors, other people on campus use this as an illustration to show, it, basically to give a, a kind of one picture visual of what that liberal arts education is like. Um, theater performances on our campus involve students from all different types of majors or departments. We have biology students, business students, psychology students, you name it, that are getting involved in our theater productions. And, uh, and this, this one in particular uh, shows that, yes, it's a theater production, there's acting going on, but they're also using a lot of like humor, physical comedy, a lot of uh, critical thinking and planning skills. This particular theater event is all uh, brainstormed, uh, written, and created by the students. The theater professors uh, don't actually like make any of the content or write any of, of the dialogue. It's all student uh, done, both the planning and then the acting, of course. Um, so that kind of summarizes what I'm trying to, trying to say in that that's what the liberal arts education is about. You're getting that broad um, experience, education that will prepare you for all things that life has to throw at you. And uh, this is a, a fun example of uh, what appears to be two students in dinosaur costumes having a potato chip eating contest. Um, another great example, um, I used the illustration before of uh, a liberal arts education and experience prepares you for potentially careers that don't even exist yet. I have another good example of that. Um, this is a picture of an alum from a number of years ago. Uh, his name is Eric, uh, but he is famously known in the online gaming world as Doa. Uh, he, he got a communications degree here from Bethany uh, back in the day. And, and back when he graduated, uh, online gaming, I think was just in its infancy stage. And uh, he now works uh, online as basically a video game esports uh, commentator. Uh, or play-by-play -play broadcaster, if you will. Um, so that job didn't exist as little as, say, five to seven years ago, uh, but he's able to, he's been able to use his liberal arts experience that he had here at Bethany, along with his education and skills that he learned along the way in the classroom um, to pursue his passion, which was, was esports, video games, and has turned that into a, a very successful career. And uh, he's, he's, pretty well known and recognized in that community. Um, so we, we uh, uh, hold him up as a, a great example of kind of a, a maverick, if you will, of taking, taking this experience and moving forward with it to do great things. Um, this slide I, I thought I would throw in there, um, me and admissions, um, I use this slide a lot as well. Uh, I think our success rates, these numbers, uh, speak for themselves, our, our education. Like I said, we're preparing students for jobs and careers once they leave Bethany. There's a lot more to it than that, um, but we are having a lot of success with our students uh, getting into grad school, getting into their chosen career field once they leave Bethany, um, which is ultimately the kind of the end goal for students. That, Like I said, that's kind of the number one reason why students go to college in the first place is so that they're able to get that job and successfully transition into adulthood afterwards. And let's attempt this video. So I guess just to, to wrap up, this will maybe be where I'll end, um, just a short video clip, um, kind of repeating some of the same things maybe I already alluded to, um, but just trying to paint that picture of how a Bethany education is not just an education, it's, it's a unique New, excuse me, unique experience uh, that prepares you for what comes next.
For more than 100 years, our campus has kept watch over the city of Mankato with a mission to educate. Since then, we've grown, we've progressed, but our passion for teaching remains as strong as our beliefs, as strong as our foundation. A place where the spiritual world is as critical as the intellectual, where your faith is fed and your relationship with your savior is fueled. A place where friendships that last beyond this campus begin and the possibilities to do anything, be anything, are within reach. Because at Bethany Lutheran College, you are not just one of thousands. You're a name, you're a face, someone to be remembered. Bethany will help you answer the question you've been asked since you were young. What do you wanna be when you grow up? The answer has changed over the years, but here you are, grown up, ready to discover the answer. And here, the answers are endless with an education that encourages you to try it all. You'll discover what you love, the thing that ignites you, that drives you to do more, to be more. But don't worry, you don't have to get there alone. Experienced educators will help guide you on your way to a career that fits you, to a place where you'll discover new things, to a path where you'll leave your mark. Let Bethany Lutheran College be your start. All right, that's all I've, I've got for now. Uh, thanks again for checking out Bethany via this Zoom call today. Thanks much, Ben. Uh, we're gonna switch over to Brandon, moving over to Concordia College. Thank you, Brandon, for being here as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Brandon Wente. I'm with Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, um, kind of in the northwestern part of the state. Um, and as I was thinking about, you know, how I normally talk about liberal arts education and uh, sort of what are the values, what are the sort of key components to it, um, so I thought it'd be maybe a little bit more appropriate to let one of our professors talk about uh, sort of his experience of teaching in the liberal arts and what that means. Um, this summer we've been doing a lot of virtual visits, um, as many colleges probably have been doing, and um, we've been doing them sort of focused on individual academic departments, but then having professors specifically talk about liberal arts as, as part of these presentations. Um, so the professor you're going to hear from is a pre-recorded session, but his name is Dr. Vince Arnold. Um, he teaches in our history department at Concordia and is also the chair of the humanities. So, um, and then he kind of goes into like some examples of uh, ways that he's seen the liberal arts um, sort of showcase and things. I'm going to get that queued up here. Um, and then I'll share a little bit more context after it's done. Uh, the liberal arts faculty at Concordia see important, if not critical, new challenges for the contemporary world, a uh, world which shapes the way we prepare our students. So, for example, you know, in a world where change is constant, our goal is simply to prepare students to be curious, uh, to be intellectually flexible, and to be creative and innovative. Uh, in a world where cultures coexist and interact, sometimes well and regrettably sometimes not so well, uh, we prepare students to understand and to appreciate the, um, the diversity or what I would say would be the splendid diversity of humankind. Uh, in a world facing environmental and resource challenges, uh, we prepare our students to think profoundly about our place within the broader natural world and how we can and how we should live sustainably. And finally, I'd say in a, in a world of COVID-19, uh, a world that is so overwhelming um, that one is tempted to, I would argue, to disengage from society, uh, we prepare our students to discern effective and satisfying ways of responsibly engaging that world for the good of our neighbors, but also for the good of ourselves. Uh, overall, and I guess the bottom line is, 
the liberal arts faculty of Concordia College take up these tasks and new challenges by opening doors for students, opening uh, ideas and opportunities that our students really haven't uh, seen before, and by helping them on their professional journey as citizens of the world. Uh, we don't just educate you and then wave goodbye as you leave campus with your diploma. Uh, you're quickly going to find that many of your professors become your lifelong mentors and lifelong friends. Uh, your professors are the ones you're going to turn to for advice, uh, for encouragement and direction, both on campus, but clearly after you graduate. Now, very quickly, let me give you one example of this type of, of connection. And I want to speak very quickly about one of my former students. Uh, I've been a, a professor here at Concordia since, uh, since 1991. And again, I teach history, but one of the things that I really enjoy doing is uh, about every other year, I take groups of students uh, to study history abroad. We, we go to Europe. And in one of my earlier uh, travel trips, it was a May seminar, one of my students who was a sophomore at the time was a biology major, but she had a real interest in history. And her, her goal was to get into med school. Uh, but she decided that this May seminar, which she would be able to take over the summer, was her best opportunity to uh, study her passion of, of history and to get the type of international experience that she wanted. And after four weeks of travel through Italy, Austria, and Germany, she came back and it, it truly had a profound impact on her. Um, one of the things that we quickly found out was she wanted to do more of this. And it was a little bit difficult given the demands of a pre-med major. But ultimately, working as kind of an unofficial advisor, we were able to figure out a way for her during the uh, fall semester of her junior year uh, to actually study abroad again. She went for a full semester abroad and studied in India. And uh, while she was there, one of the components of the program was um, a two-week internship, which was connected with this integrative learning, which was mentioned in the video. Today, we oftentimes refer to this as PEAK. It's a pivotal experience in applied knowledge. And um, she contacted me and she said, Dr. Arnold, I don't know what to do on this. Can you help me out? And this is, by the way, in the late 1990s. So I'm showing my age a little bit here. But I, uh, I contacted her and I said, why don't you contact uh, Mother Teresa in Calcutta and see if you could work with her um, in the, the Sisters of Charity? And her, re her very quick response was something like, yeah, sure. And, and my response was, well, you know, you're not going to know. And I mean, the worst thing she could say is, no, we can't do this. Well, after a couple of weeks, she got back in touch with me and she said, you're not going to believe it, but Mother Teresa responded to me and she's invited me to work with her for two weeks in Calcutta. Uh, when she came home, uh, she finished up her studies in biology uh, for pre-med. She applied to six different uh, med schools. She had six different interviews. And I believe in every interview she had, the first question that they all asked was, what was it like to work with Mother Teresa? Um, you know, they, it's more than just the book knowledge. It's these impactful experiences that really make a difference. And these are the things that your professors are really going to be able to help you with. Again, both on campus, but, but afterwards. Well, you know, again, this is, I, I, from my standpoint, one of the important reasons why, uh, you know, the liberal arts and your faculty here at Concordia are so important. And so I like that example simply because, um, I mean, both, it was something that, that came up this summer and as I was thinking about the liberal arts, but uh, granted, yes, this is maybe a little bit of a, an older example of like late 90s, um, but we still see this story all the time of students who are, uh, very interested in doing like a major in the sciences, but they have these passions in history and language and other ways that they can draw in those uh, ideas of a well-rounded education um, as part of a liberal arts experience. Um, and I, I followed up with Dr. Arnold just to make sure like 
Um, where is the student now? What are they doing? They are a practicing uh, physician in Colorado. So uh, they did get into med school and they are, they are still currently practicing. So um, I'm sure that there'll be other questions and I'll sort of chime in with uh, my own thoughts and ideas with liberal arts, but I'll pass it on to our next presenter. Great, thank you, Brandon. Thanks for sharing that video. Okay, we're moving to um, Sadie at St. Mary's. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everyone. My name is Sadie. Uh, I will be representing St. Mary's, as was just said, and so I'm just going to share my screen with you as I kind of tell you a little bit more about what that looks like at St. Mary's. All right, and to start off, I'm going to try doing a video as well. Ooh, there we go. Ooh, actually, I'm just going to make sure that everything is good to go. I forgot to hit a specific button, so I'm going to do that. All right. look at St. Mary's. Um, we're located in Winona, Minnesota, and we serve an undergraduate population of just under 1,100 students. Um, our student-to-faculty ratio is 13 to 1, and then you can see our five most popular majors as well, um, or kind of the umbrella areas of those majors, which include biology, business, education, criminal justice, and psychology. And then our four-year graduation rate is 64.2%, and 95% of our students are employed in graduate school, the military, or another long-term volunteering um, opportunity within a year of graduation. So I'm first going to just start off by answering the question, why a liberal arts education? Uh, findings from a study done by the Association of American Colleges and Universities found that almost 75% of employers nationally would advise students to pursue a liberal arts education, right? So that is just coming from, you know, the horse's mouth of the people that are going to be employing you after you're done um, with graduation want you to pursue um, a liberal arts education because of the benefits that it really does have for you. Robert Maynard Hutchins, an American educator who served as president of the University of Chicago, also wrote an essay um, entitled The Great Conversation. And he wrote that the aim of liberal education is human excellence, both in private and in public, meaning excellence as a person and as a member of society. And this really feeds into our mission statement at St. Mary's. Um, we're enhanced by the LaSallian Catholic tradition, um, and our mission really is to awaken, nurture, and empower learners to ethical lives of service and leadership. And so um, what this means, right, is that we want to make sure that we prepare students and we educate them so that they not only have um, that intrinsic benefit of developing their character and their leadership, but they're able to use those skills and what they've learned to go and enhance society as well. And the liberal arts really does um, give you a great breadth and depth of knowledge. That's always what we refer to at St. Mary's. 
Um, not only will you be studying your main major, your area of study, so if you want to become a physical therapist, right, you'll take all of those courses um, in the sciences, for example, to make sure that you are able to diagnose and treat certain injuries and ailments. Um, you'll take classes on, um, you know, ethics within the healthcare system um, and how to relate to your patients. But it also allows you to take courses that you might not have taken otherwise. And so um, it just gave, and taking those other courses really does um, allow you to learn across disciplines, like I said, courses that you may never have thought to take before. It gives you a perspective, right? So you can come in under the patient care lens as you learn in education if you want to be a physical therapist, but you also get to bring in um, other perspectives that you've gained um, in learning across different areas, whether that be philosophy or history or art, communication. Um, and you get to develop uh, critical thinking and communication skills, which are two very sought after um, skills to have for employers as well. Just a little bit of the difference between general education courses and the liberal arts and their interconnectedness too. Um, general education uh, refers to the common core of courses expected of all undergraduate students, which usually includes a range of liberal arts courses. Um, and then the liberal arts uh, refers to, uh, you know, the, the mode of education that leads to a rich and varied understanding of the world. And so while they're interconnected, um, while you can find uh, the liberal arts in general education, um, I did want to point out the difference um, a little bit before I kick it into how it looks at St. Mary's. I'm going to talk just briefly about our integrated general education program, or what we refer to as IGEP. You can choose from five interdisciplinary minors, and they include environmental sustainability, creativity and inquiry, global diversity and social justice, self society and the sacred, and then um, LaSallian honors, which is by invitation based on GPA and ACT. Um, but any of the minors that you choose will include a senior year capstone um, where you will address real world issues through a local community project, You'll develop an e-portfolio um, that shows your skills and your accomplishments, and you'll develop those really great communication and critical thinking skills as well. So kind of the nuts and bolts of how that looks at St. Mary's, there's three components. So the first year experience, when you come in as a first year student, you'll be taking 14 credits um, of, um, in that interdisciplinary minor among you know, your other courses for your major. And so you'll take an anchor course, which is you studying a topic that's outside your major of choice, a first year writing course that focuses on reflective writing, which helps prepare you for your portfolio, um, a quantitative reasoning class that usually includes a science or math course, and then a theology course. And then as you move out of your first year, you'll take 24 credits. Um, in that specific minor that you chose, and all minors participate in courses in the areas of theology, philosophy, history, literature, uh, something in math, computer science, or the natural sciences with a lab, um, something in social sciences, art, and communication. So again, that's where the general education courses and the liberal arts meet at St. Mary's, where um, your general education will require you to take courses in the liberal arts. And so um, that last piece to another uh, component is the capstone, that community project at the end of your four years, which allows you to work with other students and, you know, incorporate the perspective that you've gained across the disciplines that you've all um, studied in at your time at St. Mary's. Uh, just a few additional requirements. You will do two wellness courses and you can, uh, or experiences, you can see what um, would constitute as a wellness experience in the parentheses. And then we also do cultural engagement requirements. And so that really is to create an awareness of how culture shapes worldview and it acts to develop and test shared meanings among members of social groups. And so um, examples that have counted um, in the past have included a study abroad experience, um, volunteering at the Winona Warming Shelter with our Intro to Human Services course, um, a soul trip, which is where students will go to a different part of the country, serve the community there and also learn about some issues, some social justice issues plaguing um, the people of the community there. Um, or you can serve as a countdown to college counselor. 
Um, and that's a program where we bring in partner LaSallean institutions um, and we um, do a program uh, for college readiness with um, those schools that typically have a large number of students that are um, minority and that come from a low socioeconomic status as well. And so those are just a few of the experiences that have counted in the past. Um, and so total, your interdisciplinary minor is about 35 to 40 credits that will fulfill your general education requirements as well. And you can also do another minor too um, outside of the interdisciplinary one. You can do one that's more geared towards your area of study. And so here's just my contact information. Again, I said my name is Sadie Halfrich. I'm a senior regional admission counselor at St. Mary's. Um, that's where you can find me. You can find more information at our website and or follow us on some of our social media platforms as well. But uh, I look forward to answering some more questions and yeah, I'm happy to share about the liberal arts in St. Mary's. Great, thank you, Sadie, for um, all, all that information. We're gonna jump over to our last presenter now, um, Shannon at St. Olaf. Thank you, Shannon, for being here as well. Yeah, hi, everybody. I am super excited to be talking with you today. First, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And Shannon, can I jump in just for a second? Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I just wanted to um, uh, share uh, the fact that we are eager for any questions people want to share with us, you can put them in the chat function or you can use the Q&A function, which is kind of snazzy if you want to uh, lean that way. But either way, if you type something in as a question, we'll bring it up when we get through the presentations and have time for Q&A. So thanks. All right, so. To start off, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. So like I said, my name is Shannon. I'm one of the assistant deans of admissions at St. Olaf, and I've been there for about three years now. Um, I am also a graduate of St. Olaf, which I mentioned specifically in this context, since we are talking about the liberal arts, because um, when I think back on my time at St. Olaf, I think it is like the happiest accident in the world that I ended up at a place that was so founded in the liberal arts because I think um, when I was in all of your shoes as um, a prospective student, I kind of just like heard liberal arts and you know, I heard it come up a lot and I was like, oh, some colleges identify as this, some don't, but I never like really got a grasp on what the differences were, or what it meant. So then when I was a student, at St. Olaf throughout those four years, it just became um, a huge part of that experience. So I'll elaborate that on that a bit more. Um, but just to get started super quickly with a couple of demographic um, fast facts for St. Olaf, we're in Northfield, Minnesota. So we're about 45 minutes south of the Twin Cities. We share the town with Carleton College, another Minnesota private college. Um, so two colleges in one town um, is definitely fun. We've got some, um, rivalries and, and things like that that make it fun. Um, and we overall have a population size of 3,000 students. So we're definitely in the small liberal arts category um, where class sizes are able to be small. There's a strong sense of community where you get to know a lot of different people on campus, um, which is great. Okay, so I think a huge part of liberal arts is rooted in academics. So when you're thinking about your experience at a liberal arts college, I also think it's really important to think about um, like how does that break down each year with the classes that you're taking? And I think this is probably the thing um, when I say like it was a happy accident that I ended up at a liberal arts college, what I'm thinking about most. Um, because I think I thought about it as, all right, I'm gonna get to college, I'll take um, sort of like Sadie was saying, the difference between um, general education requirements and liberal arts. I think that is really where my mind was. So I was thinking uh, my first year, I'll take some general education classes and then after that I'll move on to my major and that'll be that. And I think um, to shift that thinking a little bit, what ended up happening is that you kind of are taking a combination of your major electives and general education requirements um, sort of all mixed together over the course of your four years at St. Olaf. So the way that it breaks down is it's about a third of your classes will be for your major, a third of your classes will be the general education requirements, and a third will be electives. 
And then those thirds, like I said, really are kind of all spread out over the course of all four years. And you might maybe at the beginning of your experience, if you're trying to figure out what you want to major in, still exploring a little bit, maybe you'll be a little heavier on those general education requirements at first, but most students are taking some kind of general education requirement or elective all the way through their senior year, which is really exciting because that keeps it um, very interdisciplinary the whole time. So you're always sort of being asked to confront how is what I'm studying in this class affecting what I'm studying in another class. And then beyond that, the thing that I was really grateful for is I, I was definitely someone who went into college with a lot of really strong interests. I didn't know quite what I wanted to do, but I was really curious about a lot of things. And the best part about liberal arts was that never had to stop. I think we think about this flexibility as being important when it comes to figuring out what we want to major in, but it by no means has to stop after you figure out what you want to major in. I think for me, um, kind of some of the most influential classes that I took happened later and those almost had a bigger impact on me thinking about what I wanted to do with my career um, than my major did, which I think is, is awesome. You just never have to stop developing and um, thinking about what you're interested in. And the liberal arts uh, sort of process and how you're always taking those different types of classes is really helpful in that. Another way that the liberal arts are really present at St. Olaf is through our study abroad program. Study abroad is very popular at St. Olaf. Um, and one of the things that's really exciting about it is that many students choose to study abroad in something that is maybe not at all related to their major. And while you can study abroad in something that is related to your major, you're very encouraged to use it as a time to tap into another interest. So I think one example of this is say, you're really interested in another language. Um, but maybe you decide, you know, I, I really am passionate about French or I'm really passionate about Spanish, but I don't actually want to major in that. You could incorporate a study abroad experience to get really in-depth um, experiential learning in that area. And then that is just sort of a piece of your education um, that you're able to do through study abroad, even though you're not majoring in that area specifically. Another way that the liberal arts are really present at St. Olaf for a lot of students is through our fine arts programs. I think that um, the kind of ideal behind this at St. Olaf is that you can get a really high quality conservatory level fine arts education, um, but we still want you to be really well-rounded and we think you can have both of those things present at the same time. Um, a theater professor that I had in college, I always used to say theater is not about theater, theater is about everything else, which I think could be applied to maybe every single subject that you study in college. Um, so I, I, I love that. And I think that you get that rigor, um, you know, in the fine arts, but you don't have to sacrifice rigor in any other area. And I think actually, um, with academics also in the liberal arts, something that was really um, engaging for me is that classes that you take outside of your major um, are going to be just as rigorous as your major classes because there's really no class that is just people in that major. You're always in a room um, with people studying lots of different things, which keeps it really exciting. Um, and lastly, before I wrap up, um, a huge part of liberal arts education is also thinking about how to apply this to um, a number of different careers after you graduate. So at St. Olaf, our Career Advising Center is the Piper Center. I mean, some of the ways that the center is set up to help support students in thinking about what they want to do after graduation um, is through internships, which we also provide funding for if they are unpaid or underpaid. Um, and then we also have our, like all the colleges on this call, we have a really uh, wide alumni network that students are always able to tap into. And I think with a career center specifically at a liberal arts college, they're going to help you think about um, not only that first job you get after graduation, but what do you find meaningful and what do you want to do um, with your career, you know, in 10 years or kind of with your life on a greater scale. They'll help you think about how you can apply all these different skills that you've gained to a whole bunch of different things. So that, that is all I have. Thank you, everybody. Great, thank you. I, um, I've really enjoyed hearing the four of you tackle 
a kind of challenging question, right? Like just how to quantify or describe what makes the liberal arts, what even they are and how valuable they can be isn't easy. So um, hearing from all four of you and layering that, I think gave a really a good picture. Um, so uh, let's see. I had a question for you about, um, I was curious about the myths you hear about, about the liberal arts. And I think Ben, you started with one, you know, like if you, and, and it's really, and I'm sure it comes from a very sincere place because, you know, everyone's got their jargon and liberal arts can be jargony. Um, and some people might hear the word liberal and think political as, as you did, Ben. Um, are there other misperceptions that you guys hear about the liberal arts that come to mind that you want to kind of straighten, straighten out? Anyone want to raise your hand on that? Sadie, why don't you go and then Brandon? Yeah, for sure. So I think, and Ben touched on it at the beginning too, I think sometimes people feel like, oh, I'm gaining experience across all these different areas. Like, how does this prepare me for my job that I, you know, I know I'm going to be in for the next 60 years or, you know, however long. And it's like, at the end of the day, so many people change their career many times within um, joining the workforce. And so um, I think just gaining those different perspectives, like we've all mentioned, and um, tapping into the skills that are really necessary to succeed in whatever job you go into is super important. And so um, I, I would argue that oftentimes when you just focus on your major or maybe that one profession that you think you're going to want to do for the rest of your life, you really kind of pigeonhole yourself in that you're like, oh shoot, this isn't what I expected it to be, and now what do I do? Um, so I think that's kind of a myth that I hear a lot, that it's like, yeah, like it doesn't help prepare you, um, you know, to enter that area that you want. But even if you do stay in that area for the next 40 years or so, um, those skills will be transferable in your job there too. Thank you. Brandon, do you have a, a myth you might wanna beat back? Yeah, so I think I hear a lot of people think about like liberal arts as very theory based or it's sort of too centered in the humanities that if a school is a liberal arts college, um, they can't have a really strong science program or they can't have a really good business program. And I think that like, I mean, schools are going to have uh, a variety of different skill sets, uh, just, you know, based on, you know, their reputations and then some things that they're that they're doing. So a liberal arts education doesn't necessarily mean that it's like, only theory based or that it's only this kind of one thing that you can really sort of find a lot of those like uh, strong technical skills and strong science based learning or strong business based or or kind of going back to some of those uh, kind of reinforcing the myth of strong humanities, strong arts, those types of things too. Um, but knowing that at the end of the day that you have the flexibility to expand beyond those to um, take what you're learning in the sciences but apply those uh, you know, sort of other perspectives into why we study science in this way or to take business and apply, you know, some arts perspectives to it or a variety of different things. So um, in the, kind of the heart of a liberal arts education. And, and Ben, since you would brought up the political piece, you, you've, you've heard that firsthand, I'm sure. Um, can, how do you kind of straighten, how do you explain that when, when people bring that up? Good question. Yeah, that's that's one that we have gotten before. A little bit hard to answer. Um, as I said before, it, it's almost kind of humorous to us because we're extremely conservative, um, the opposite of what that word means in the political sense. Um, I always just try to explain it as best I can. It, it is meant in a way that it's very broad or all-encompassing, like, like Sadie and Brandon were just talking about you're getting the job training, but there's also so many other doors that can be open to you and so many different opportunities or experiences that you might not get if you, as Sadie said, kind of commit yourself or even pigeonhole yourself to one particular department or field of study. Um, I think uh, so many students today are so unsure, undecided. There's so many options. I, I feel like almost two-thirds, three-fourths of all students that I meet with have no idea what they want to major in, and that's okay. That's normal at this point. Um, and a liberal arts education at one of our institutions can help you try on different departments or majors or possible careers and, and ultimately help you find a 
uh, career track that you maybe never have considered before or didn't even know existed um, until you came to a liberal arts institution and, and got that broad or liberal um, educational experience. Thank you. That reminds me of um, Shannon, a point that you were making that really caught my ear and help, I thought was really helpful was when you were walking through how um, you can kind of imagine um, kind of having slices of your uh, coursework while you're in college and some of it's going to be tied to your major and some of it's going to be electives and some of it's going to be that more foundational work that sort of has breadth to it. I think that's part of probably um, why Ben's point works, right? Because if you come in as you're undecided and you have, you're going to be in all these different places, you can experience different fields maybe and find one that you really fall in love with. Is that the idea? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's like, um, you know, the whole idea is like your first year, you know, you're going to take a set of classes that you'll pick with your advisor. But I think even if you try to make a four year plan on day one and try to slot out all of your classes, like I know I definitely did because I am a planner. Um, but what you discover is that, you know, maybe something is interesting to you in one class and then that will really inform what you want to take for your next general, you know, because there is um, a lot of choices within each category. So yeah, I think I, I would just echo all of that. And I think what is great is that you just don't have a path set out from day one and your interests can really organically develop over time. And the great thing is that you have the space and the encouragement and you're in an environment that celebrates that continuous learning and continuous curiosity. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things that I feel like when I see clips, big, uh, we see a lot of news stories come through my office and sometimes when there's a clip that's bashing the liberal arts, they often are actually um, being critical of the humanities. And I think that for some people, uh, there's some equivalency of what the liberal arts means to the humanities. And I know this is maybe, a, this is like another road, but I, I do think um, maybe there's partial, part of this conversation is how do we explain the humanities and how that um, collection of area, uh, areas of exploration has value. But the liberal arts is, uh, can get defined a lot of different ways, but liberal arts includes beyond humanities, social sciences, and hard sciences. So um, there's sort of that issue too. Anyone want to defend the humanities? Help, uh, help us stand up for the humanities. Okay, Shannon, you can. I can, yeah, I can try. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think like, I, I remember from when I was a student and in my work now, I think there's this notion that like, oh, well, I am not gonna major in history because I don't wanna be a history teacher. And that that somehow is like the only thing you could do with a history major. And I think it's that it's sort of rooted in the notion of like, my future career's title is in my major. And I think to get comfortable with the liberal arts, you do kind of have to dig into that and um, realize and accept that that is really like not the case for a lot of people. And if you look at, I, I know at St. Olaf, there's a tool on the website um, where you can like click on a major and see what grads from the last 10 years are doing. And if you clicked on history, it would not just be history teachers, like it would be, you know, um, doctors and scientists, even with majors in history, but even beyond that, like so many things that there are not, so many careers that don't have a major with that exact title in the name, you know? Yeah, that's a really, that's a good point. And I think of, um, and, but, but, and there's something about, you know, it's also the, the nature of the times we live in and, and there's, um, there can be kind of interests that, um, emerge in certain areas and what we call STEM these days has a lot of appeal and that and that's great. We, all of these colleges are strong in those science and uh, math areas. It's it's a core commitment of all these institutions um, but it's not an either or and I think um, and I love the example one of you shared of the oh it was your video Brandon of the the biology major who loved history you know like it can be both and and we maybe we need people who are both um, in our society um so yeah and and that and that can work for the undecided or for anyone yeah i like that 
Are, are there other myths out there or misperceptions about liberal arts colleges or liberal arts opportunities that any of you have in mind? I think I was just going to say, um, adding on to it. So I had a student last year who was interested in a science program and was like, oh, like I've recently been told by a counselor that like it doesn't look as good when I'm applying for like a graduate school if I get a BA versus a BS, like a Bachelor of Arts versus a Bachelor of Science. Um, which that was astounding to me because at least, you know, I'm speaking from experience at St. Mary's. St. Mary's has a lot of um, health related fields and a lot of times we work in collaboration with Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And so um, I know we just established like a three plus two physician's assistant program. And so when I heard that, I was kind of like, you know, Mayo Clinic isn't sitting there being like, oh, well, they only got a BA, so we're not going to admit them to this program, you know? And so for me, that was just so bizarre to be like, again, like, it's not just about a BS, getting you into um, grad school, bachelor's of arts is just a different pathway, um, but they still prepare you for what you want to do, whether that's entering the workforce right away or applying for med school, you know? So that was kind of bizarre for me to hear. Um, and kind of wanted to debunk it with her a little bit too. Thank you. I have you know, part of what I think I've heard from all of you about the liberal arts is that it's a combination of, it, it, that, that there's inherently something interdisciplinary about it. Um, and I think each of your institutions has probably really unique ways that you try to spark that and, and ensure that happens, that people are, you know, can love biology and history or whatever that combo is. Um, are there any examples any of you, any of you want to share about how as an institution that interdisciplinary thinking is really encouraged and nurtured um, in ways that maybe, maybe something concrete or um, that would help people externally kind of get it? Anyone have a thought on that? I know that's a big question. Brandon. I'll maybe try and start, um, or at least give some kind of, uh, some sort of example of, of maybe something that we do or something that is similar to other institutions. Um, so students are, uh, and Dr. Arnold talked about it very briefly in the video, but do these peak experiences where they have to uh, sort of apply what they're learning in their academic programs to something in like a real world setting. And whether that's like an internship or on campus or off campus research or study abroad uh, opportunity, they're taking sort of these big ideas of a liberal arts education and then um, applying them and it could be in something that's directly related to their major or their internship could be something that's like maybe as Shannon said like it's not related to the job title but it's you know something that they can still take those skill sets of strong speaking abilities strong writing skills um, and showcasing how that can still be applicable in different job capacities um, and so then just kind of tackling yeah those big ideas and those big uh, interdisciplinary things and then working with your professors and working with your mentors along the way to sort of identify what was the value of that experience and how can I talk about this with future employers and that kind of thing. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? Shannon. Yeah, I thought of two quick examples. One um, that I think is, is pretty specific is like um, at St. Olaf, and I'm sure at all of these schools, there's a writing requirement that you have to fulfill by the time you graduate. And at St. Olaf, there are four writing requirements. And I think you might be, maybe you're tempted to think of writing as like, that would be an English class, or that's something that you would do um, only in an English classroom. But every single department at St. Olaf has a class that carries the writing requirement. So you can take a science class where you get your writing requirement. So I think it's like, you know, kind of like we've all been saying that sort of um, meeting of skills and writing is certainly a skill that can be applied to so many different areas, obviously. Um, and then one other thing that is specifically for first year students is at St. Olaf, we have what's called conversations programs, which kind of, I think, prepares students to approach all of their classes with an interdisciplinary mind. Um, but it is sort of, um, you have like a really specific structure through these programs right at the beginning. So one example is there's an American conversation program um, 
and the way these function are they're a class each semester for the first two years where you're with the same group of students and the same professor and so you're looking essentially like at american history but you have all sorts of credits that you're fulfilling in the class so there is a history credit but there's also a sociology credit a political science credit a theology credit so you're there the classes are like literally built to be interdisciplinary that's a great example shannon i I love that um, that program. Um, so actually, when we think ahead, people are always trying to think ahead. Of course, when they're choosing when they're choosing colleges and majors and thinking about the rest of their life at this stage, um, are there aspects of what's happening in the world and maybe the emergence of a gig economy or other factors that you think will affect how people per, um, choose liberal arts? Uh, options or not? I mean, how do, does anyone see a connection or implications um, emerging from the future of work and the future of our economy and the liberal arts? Any, any ways those tie together that come to mind for you? I can go. Sadie? Yeah, I can go. Um, so I think and I don't know, like I haven't looked at a lot of projections, but I have seen, I mean, a bunch of reports have come out over the last few years about how um, important liberal arts are and, and that a lot of the skills that you learn are skills that employers are seeking. So I would think that with everything going on, um, a student would want to be more marketable, I guess, in what they're um, able to, to offer their employer, right? Because oftentimes students look at the growth of a field and there might not be as much growth in a field, you know, in the next um, few years. We just don't know how that's going to ebb and flow. And so I would say a liberal arts education is a better investment ever than ever, um, just because, again, you're able to go in and say, well, I learned all of this in my, with my liberal arts education, so I feel confident in applying for a number of different jobs, not just the one job that I majored in that might be streamlined. So um, I don't know the projections, but I, I would feel like this would hopefully encourage students now more than ever to look into the liberal arts. So. That's great. And it, I, th I think it's a great point to close on. We're just about at um, five o'clock and um, I've, really, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I think it was really uh, helpful to hear all of you kind of layering, layering up your views together. So th I thank all four of you for spending your time on this. Uh, and those calling in for listening. So, Tom, any updates you want to share before we end the call? Nope, I'll be sending a follow-up to all the attendees with a recording of this and check us out on our social media to, to see snapshots of these fine presenters. <laughs> great. Well, thank you. Thanks so much, panelists. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone.